May 12th, 2022, meeting of the Parker Planning Commission to order at 7 p.m. Uh, would you please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, roll call absent uh, are Eric, Kim, Ileana, and Roxy. And Nick is seated for Ileana. And so we do have a quorum. Are there any additions to our deletions from the agenda? No, sir, there are not. Okay. Uh, the minutes. We have the minutes. From the meeting of April 28th, 2022, are there any corrections, deletions to the minutes from May 12th? No, I have none. No. no. All right, do we have a motion to approve? I move we approve the minutes from May 12th. I'll second. It's been moved by Ruth Ann, seconded by Nick, that we approve the minutes from um, April 28th, 2022, and I will call the question. Uh, Nick? Aye. Uh, Ruth Ann? Aye. Rich? Aye. Chair is aye. It's approved unanimously. All right. Next item. Item 7A, Newland Crossing Sketch and Preliminary Plan. We will open the public hearing at 7.01. Uh, Brianna? Or Stacy, I can't remember who's doing this one. <laughs> It'll be me tonight. Okay. We'll give Stacy a second to load up the PowerPoint, though. Perfect. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman and Planning Commission. This is a proposal for a sketch and preliminary plan for Newland Crossing. The subject property is located on the northeast corner of Main Street and Chambers Road. The applicant PCS group is requesting the approval of the sketch and preliminary plan for the area highlighted in red on the screen. The sketch and preliminary plan applications are for 194 single family detached residential lots, 26.85 acres of open space, and 6.03 acres of park space. The proposed sketch and preliminary plan identifies the layout of the subdivision to meet the standards outlined in the land development ordinance the Newland Crossing Plan Development, and the related roadway and stormwater design criteria manuals. The annexation agreement for the Newland Crossing Development outlines the amount of parks, open space, and trails dedication required. For both the sketch and preliminary plan, the applicant is proposing a total of 6.03 acres of park space shown in the areas, which exceeds the minimum amount of park space required. This includes three neighborhood parks. The applicant is also proposing 26.85 acres of open space, which satisfies the minimum requirements of open space. Trail systems are proposed to be provided connecting throughout the development. The proposed project will provide subdivisions. The development will also provide a regional trail connection along the new regional trail that will close the missing link between Stonegate to the north and Meridian to the south. The proposed sketch and preliminary plan meets the obligations outlined in the annexation agreement and the town's land development ordinance. The Newland Crossing development will be served by Main Street and Chambers Road shown in red. A new collector road will be constructed to support local roadway connections throughout the community and between the arterial roads, which is shown in blue. Additionally, a new connection to the existing Carousel Farms neighborhood will be provided for connectivity, which is shown in purple or magenta. Staff has reviewed the proposal and as outlined in staff's report has determined that the project is consistent with the master plan the project meets the minimum requirements of the land development ordinance and the Newland Crossing plan development. 
This project provides adequate access, infrastructure, drainage facilities, and design considerations. Utility providers have confirmed capacity and availability. All referral agency comments have been addressed and the public notice requirements have been met. Therefore, staff recommends that Planning Commission recommend Town Council approve the Newland Crossing sketch and preliminary plan. Staff is available for any questions that Planning Commissioners may have. And the applicant is also present this evening to answer any questions and would also like to provide a presentation tonight. Okay. Questions for Brianna? None. Okay, does the applicant want to step forward and state your name and address for the record, please? Good evening, Commissioners. Alan Cunningham with PCS Group, 200 Calamath Street, Denver, 80223. Thank you for your time tonight. Um, on behalf of Lennar, I'm pleased to be here. Uh, we'll give it a pretty brief presentation. I think that um, Brianna's staff report was fairly comprehensive to give you the background, but we'll run through a few different things. Okay, so next slide, please. So quickly, Brianna showed you the context. As mentioned, the Newland Crossing site, it's just over 100 acres uh, located on the northeast corner of Chambers and Main Street. Um, and it's this, the entirety of what you see there in yellow is contained within the Newland Crossing plan development plan, which has been previously approved. Next slide, please. Just a little bit different view to give you the context. This overlays um, the preliminary plan, obviously a rendered version of it, but on an aerial photo in bird's eye perspective where you can see Chambers Main Street and you can notice on here um, that the site is bisected by Newland Gulch. Next slide, please. So this slide's in, it's extracted from the PD. Just wanted to show a few things on here. I apologize, it's a little, little hard to read, but you can pick up on here where Newland Gulch comes through the middle of the site and, and bisects it sort of, um, it runs north-south and bisects it east-west. Also shown on here, the angled piece at the top that um, comes across paralleling the, the northern property line and goes on an angle. That's a open space tract and buffer that was defined on the PD. Um, and as you'll see, we're in compliance with that. In fact, we actually have a, a little bit larger buffer there than what's required of the PD. Um, there's a few different parcels defined on here. The two parcels to the south, where you can see where it says parcel two, the two parcels adjacent to that are commercial parcels. Those, other than some cleanup on a plat, those aren't part of this application tonight. Those are those parcels were retained by the land seller and owned by them, so those would be future development. Similarly, PA5, which is along Main Street, um, on the southern portion, kind of where that black arrow is right there, uh, is a multifamily designated site that will come before you on a future application. We're proposing townhomes on there, and that application's in process with staff um, as we speak. So the bulk of what you'll see is PA1 and PA2, which are the residential um, parcels a little bit to the north. Next slide, please. So this one highlights um, the important portions with respect to those PAs and parcels are PA1 and PA2. That's the bulk of what this application is. On PA1, you can see that in the approved PD, there's 150 units allowed, and we're proposing 109 single-family homes on that side. And then in PA2, um, that one's a little higher. It actually has a multifamily designation within the PD, allowing for up to 200 units. You can see we're only proposing 85 single family detached homes up there. So between those two parcels, the PD allows for 350 units. And as Brianna mentioned, we're with this preliminary plan and sketch plan proposing 194. The other three parcels, you can see PA3 and PA4, those are the commercial parcels that I referred to that were retained by the seller. And then PA5 that has that orangish yellow color on it um, is that multifamily site that would be future development for townhomes. Next slide, please. So this one just removes those labels. You can see the lotting of those single family homes um, that we talked about. You can also see on this plan, the three neighborhood parks that Brianna mentioned. The one we call the Central Park that's sort of south central on the plan, um, just to the north of West Parker Road. And then there's two other parks on the northern end of the site. Um, one at the northeast corner, 
the north side of, of PA1 to provide some amenities for that portion of the community. And then on the north side of PA2 as well, there's another park there that's a little more linear. And you'll be able to see that on a couple slides that are coming up. Next slide, please. So this one is to depict the regional trail connectivity for you. We're excited with the ability with this project to provide regional trail connectivity. And there's three different segments I'd like to just point out to you. The southernmost segment that will come from Main Street up to West Parker Road, and it's along the edge of the commercial parcel. That'll be constructed by the owner of that property, um, not by Lennar. When we keep moving north, um, north of West Parker Road, up to the northern property line along the west side of Newland Gulch, Lennar will be constructing the regional trail there, and it is a 10-foot regional trail. And then the third segment is moving north of our property, so off-site. Um, through this process, we've worked with the Stonegate Village Metro District to come up with an agreement to continue that regional trail. It's about a third of a mile north of the property line to where the existing concrete trail ends. And so that will also um, be constructed by Lennar to complete that regional trail connectivity up into the community to the north. Next slide, please. So we have, I have a few quick ones here just to, to show you some of the um, elements of the parks. Brianna had a slide up there as well. This is the, that central park. Um, that's just north of West Parker Road. You can see in the plan graphic that there's some open um, turf areas for play. What you see in the center, the cir circular symbol that's there is proposed to be a splash pad. Um, and we also worked with the district on that in terms of an element that they would like to see as part of the district to um, give appropriate amenities for district members. And then also within the park, there's a good sized playground with play equipment for both younger kids and, and sort of middle-aged children, um, shade shelters, tables and benches, pet stations, um, kind of typical site furnishings you'd see in a park. Next slide, please. This is just a few images of that park, um, giving you an idea of kind of the character and what we're thinking with some of the shade structures, with the splash pad in the center of the park. Oh, and I forgot to mention on the last one, there's also um, restrooms within this park as well in association with the splash pad. Next slide. So this is the northwestern park, northwestern park that's up against the open space as part of the, the open space buffer north of PA2. Um, this one's more of a linear park that includes outdoor exercise equipment, still has the shade structures and play equipment and things in the park, um, but with that linear nature, provides connectivity from chambers all the way over to Newland Gulch in the center of the property. Uh, so there's, there's that east-west connectivity over to the regional trail as well. Uh, and as mentioned, this park in combination with the open space is actually a little bit larger than the required open space tract and buffer north of this park. Next slide, please. So this one is the northeastern most park. Um, you can see with that graphic, it has a larger turf area. And then again, more play equipment also um, for ages 2 through 12 has also some outdoor exercise equipment, some outdoor games such as there's concrete table tennis, cornhole, um, there's bike racks in the park. And with the trail connectivity we have in these parks, it also um, has three pet stations, I believe, in conjunction with this park. Next slide, please. So this one just wanted to give you a, an idea of the character in some of the homes. These are photos of model homes that, are, that come from the product lines that Lennar proposes to build out here. Um, gives you an idea of just some of the different styles and character. But of course, here at Newland Crossing, there'll actually be driveways going up to the garage doors as opposed to that nice landscaping. Um, <laughs> <laughs> next slide, please. So this one's a little faded and, and somewhat hard to read. It's a quick phasing plan. Uh, if, you can, if you can make it out on, on the right-hand side and at the very top where it's colored pink, um, that would be phase one of the community. The blue area to the south, which was in PA2, um, would be phase two. And you really can't see the yellow, but it's that uh, PA5 townhome parcel that I spoke about before, which is identified as phase three. It, ideally, if all the entitlements come in, in line, I think Lennar plans to build it all as one. But if, if it does get broken down at all, it would be following that pattern. Um, it's just the, the most logical and cost-effective way to 
to do the construction. So um, next slide, please. So in summary, um, wrapping up with some of the community highlights, with this first phase with Newland Crossing, we're proposing 194 single family detached homes on two parcels that per the PD would allow up to 350. We're proposing just over six acres of parks, as Brianna mentioned, um, where the PD requires 4.63 acres. So that's an additional plus or minus 30% from the PD. Similarly, with the open space, um, PD required just under 19 acres, and we're just under 27 with what's included within these plans. So again, an increase from uh, what was required in the PD. And from Main Street North to in the Stone Gate um, Village Metro District ground where the concrete trail exists, we'll be building nearly three quarters of a mile of 10 foot concrete regional trail to provide that regional connectivity through Newland Crossing and to the community to the north. And then additionally, there's a little over one mile of trails internal to the site to provide connectivity for the residents between the neighborhood parks, the regional trail, and et cetera. So with that, um, that concludes our presentation. There are members of our team here with our civil engineers and Lennar as well, so we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. All right, questions for the development team? Um, the the townhomes, uh, it was originally slotted for townhomes in that first section in the upper left-hand corner of the property. And you've opted to go for single-family homes instead? Okay. Um, my concern is that it was proposed to have more density, and um, there's a lot of there's a need for housing that a lot, lot more housing, and you're building less housing than you actually could, which I'm sure makes the neighbors very happy because less dense is always seen as better. But my concern is that we're losing units that we could have put on that property. Right. We we definitely spoke with some of the other neighbors, and that was a concern. Um, and so, you know, striving to find that balance to be good neighbors and kind of meet that aspect while still providing housing. Um, while not part of this application on that PA5, I believe we're at 96 townhomes. So there will be another 96 coming before you, hopefully relatively soon with that site plan, um, bringing that that unit count up for the, the three different parcels. And then the, the parks, are, they, are those going to be dedicated to the town or is it going to be HOA parks? How, how will the parks work for maintenance? Those ones will be HOA maintained, I believe, yeah. HOA, okay. Yeah. Or with the district. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's all I have. Rich? Uh, I have nothing. That no, was great detailed okay. presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a question for Bryce, but not okay. for you. you you're fine. For Bryce, maybe. Um, where the the two plots of property are future uh, commercial and uh, the other that is the townhomes, do we do any signage or does do we expect the, the developer or whoever to do any signage to indicate because we know how many times we've been in these meetings and we hear from the public that, well, we were never told that that was going to be commercial. And it's in the plan and it's in the PD, but, you know, the, uh, the, that kind of thing. Has that ever been considered or? So, so that's not a requirement of obviously uh, of, of the zoning or the plat. I mean, it's not something that we've really thought about. Sure. Um, we certainly can consider that. Okay. Um, we do we do require it where roads end, and they'll be extended to have signs there. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions for Brianna? No. Nope. All right. And since this is a public hearing, uh, we always open the meeting up to comments from members of the public, uh, and that way you can either come through the Zoom feature, or you can come to the podium in person. You have three minutes to speak. There's a clock, I think, above our heads here that kind of tells you the time, and we hope that you kind of watch that if you come to speak. And so we will open it up to public comment. Please step forward to the podium if you have a comment.
and state your name and address for the record, please. Thank you. Uh, Ray Traffis, I'm at 10680 Stone Meadow Drive, Parker, and um, I'm part of the owners of the property right north of everything that's happening. Um, I think I've spoken to you before. I know I spoke to town council before, so um, I love the changes. Uh, Ruth Ann, I understand you don't like the, um, the change from uh, multifamily into single family. We love that. And that's huge for the neighbors. I like the park. I like the extension. So the things that I see on these changes, and Bryce knows me very well, um, are I think are acceptable to, at least to me. Um, I'm not speaking for my neighbors, and they may be on Zoom, and you might hear from them soon anyway. Um, is this gonna be an HOA development, is my question. And you can answer, I mean. I don't know. Okay. And then, um, what, and then my next question would be, what size of homes are we looking at for the single family? You know, 1,500 square feet, 2,000, 3,000, something like that. And then um, the commercial, trust me, everybody in my area knows where the commercial area is. So we're not concerned about that as much. Initially, we were. Um, I'm not uh, thrilled with the, um, the smell of fast food restaurants every night. Um, gasoline fumes and stuff like that. But, you know, I think progress is progress, and I think that's okay. So, I, you know, from, from my point of view, I would accept this plan. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Travis. Do we have anybody on Zoom? Uh, Stacy? If you're on Zoom, please raise your hand. We have nobody. Okay. Seeing no further comments, we will close the public comment section of the meeting. Do we have any further questions uh, for the, uh, well, I guess uh, to get at, is this gonna be an HOA? Do we know that? Yes, so every development in the town of Parker is required to have an HOA. All right, and then what was the second question? The size of homes I think was sort of yes. shown by the photographs of the Model lines. Yeah, I believe within these product lines, the these detached homes will range between four, approximately fourteen hundred square feet up to twenty six, twenty seven hundred square feet. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, any further questions for? Oh no. Oh, no. no. All right. Then we will close the public hearing at seven twenty two. Uh, commissioner discussion. I, I'm I'm really disappointed that we're not going to be adding townhomes instead of single family homes. I think that the development is lovely. I think it's really well done. I think that the trail extension is a super positive aspect to this development. Um, but I again I just I I think it would be you know, I'm struggling with losing the townhomes. Sure. And I understand that, you know, the neighbors prefer regular detached homes to yeah, townhomes, sure. but um, in terms of looking forward towards being able to house people who can work in the schools and the fire departments and the police stations and the all the service industries that we have, um, we need to look at having housing that is attainable for those folks. Um, so I'm disappointed in that aspect. Otherwise, it's a beautiful development. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm uh, a little disappointed in not having a little more townhomes also, but I understand uh, trying to compromise with the uh, communities to the to the east and to the north and having more single families there instead of townhomes, but it would like, be nice to have a little more affordable housing in the area. I do like, I think it's a very good plan, good layout. I do like the uh, idea of having the parks to the north with a buffer between um, uh, Stonegate and the new community. So, uh, but I think it's a good plan, so I, I am for it. Yep, I, uh, I agree. I also support the community, great presentation. Um, I actually um, am impressed that you guys 
worked with the uh, surrounding neighbors and, and it's a little bit less dense, um, you know, 194 out of 350. Um, so um, these days the houses are packed so close together. It's, it's kind of uh, nice. I understand we definitely need the affordable housing, but, um, you know, there's, there's townhouses planned for the future. So hopefully that will, you know, kind of bridge the gap a bit. But uh, great presentation and appreciate you uh, working with the community to, to make it happen. Uh, just piggybacking on what Nick said, I, I do appreciate the development team kind of going above and beyond with the community and mm -hmm. working with the neighborhood and uh, and then doing going beyond, I think, on some of the amenities and that kind of thing. I think uh, that'll be an important addition to the town, so I will certainly be in support. Um, do we have a motion? I move the Planning Commission recommend the Town Council approve the requested Newland Crossing sketch plan and preliminary plan. I'll second. We have to do those as two separate motions. Jeff, Bryce, Brianna. Yes, it's two separate motions. Two separate motions. Yep. So the first one is the Newland Crossing sketch plan. Okay. I move the Planning Commission recommend the Town Council approve the re requested Newland Crossing sketch plan. I'll second. It's been moved by Nick, seconded by Rich, that Planning Commission recommend Town Council approve the requested Newland Crossing sketch plan. And I will call the question. Nick? Aye. Uh, Ruth Ann? Aye. Uh, Rich? Aye. Chairman is aye, so it passes unanimously. And now do we have the second motion? I move the Planning Commission recommend the Town Council approve the requested Newland Crossing preliminary plan. Second. Moved by Nick. Seconded by Rich, that Planning Commission recommend Town Council approve the requested Newland Crossing preliminary plan. Call the question again. Nick? Aye. Ruth Ann? Aye. Rich? Aye. Chair is aye. Passes unanimously. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Brianna. Um, we will now move on to Item 7B, a public hearing on the Lot 1, Block 1, Park Glen West use by special review. We will open the public hearing at 727. All right. Good evening, Chairman, and good evening, Planning Commissioners. This is a proposal for a use by special review to allow for the use of an observation kennel and pet daycare facility for Dogtopia. Dogtopia is a franchise kenneling and pet daycare facility, is proposing to locate in an existing vacating unit located at 10140 Park Glen Way. The subject property is located at the northeast corner of Duransfelt Road and Park Glen Way in the Park Glen West subdivision. The proposed use will be going into the southern unit of, an east, of the eastern building of the lot. This lot has one other multi-tenant building to the west. This property is located within a light industrial zoning district, which requires a use by special review for observation kennels and pet daycare facilities. The proposed use is appropriate in the zoning district as there are no sensitive uses in the near vicinity of this area. The 7,570 square foot unit is roughly half of the area of the building proposed to be occupied. Additionally, the applicant is proposing an 1,800 to 1,900 square foot outdoor play area. Typical store hours are between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. The applicant is working with staff concerning additional on-site improvements. These improvements will help with the services of the operation in addition to improving the aesthetic conditions of the area. Improvements include a decorative fence around the outdoor play area and replacing dead landscaping supplemental to additional landscaping. The proposed use will not conflict with the current parking, which is appropriated for multi-tenant uses and more than suitable for these operations. Since their Denver Tech Center opening in 2020, the applicants have had zero emergency calls for medical, police, or fire services. In addition to the conditions outlined in the staff report, the applicant has provided specific plans to demonstrate mitigation of odor and noise. Facility waste will be routine, routinely collected, and a smaller waste station will be provided outside the confined part of the facility. 
Concerning noise, the franchise has a noise control plan, which has proven to be effective in other areas. The outdoor play area will be in between the masonry structure that the facility is housed and the neighboring masonry wall for the self-storage business directly to the east. Together, a vinyl fence, masonry material, and landscape buffering around the outdoor play area will provide additional noise control. This proposed use will be consistent with goals and strategies outlined in the master plan and in the strategic plan. There are nine criteria used to evaluate use by special review. These criteria ensure that the use will be, in, will be consistent with the surrounding area, will not result in an overuse of the land, create traffic congestion, or be detr detrimental to the town. Subject to the staff recommended conditions outlined in the staff report, the proposed use will meet all nine criteria items needed for recommended approval. Staff has reviewed the proposal and as outlined within the staff report has determined that the project is consistent with the master plan and the project satisfies the nine criteria required in the land development ordinance for use by special review and all public notice requirements has, have been met. Staff is recommending that Planning Commission recommend that the Town Council approve the use by special review request to allow for an observation kennel and pet daycare facility use in the light industrial zoning district with the seven conditions outlined in the staff support. Thank you for your time and attention. Staff is available for any questions that Planning Commissioners may have and the applicant will also be presenting this evening and is here to answer any operational questions. Uh, questions for Carson? Not at this time. I have none. Okay, uh, does the applicant want to step forward? Please state your name and address for the record. Larry Green, 10741 Timber Dash Avenue in Highlands Ranch, 80126. <clears throat> so the reason that we are here is um, one, a passion for dogs, and two, a need for this service. There's uh, 116 million dogs now in the United States. The dog population has grown by 15% over the last five years. The human population has grown by two to 3%. As a result of that, we have a lot more people owning dogs. And in a community like Parker, it's even more so. The average household rate is 36% of households with dogs. I don't know the number for Parker, but I know it's bigger. <clears throat> so that's why we're here. And the other thing that's happening in this business is people are bonding differently with their dogs. They're becoming more part of their family. and that's driving them to want to find the best uh, life possible for their dogs. They go to work, what do we do with our dogs? So we are all about, who's, you've got it. Okay, you can go ahead and forward. We are all about daycare at the highest possible level of quality and service. So we staff more, you'll see, I'm gonna talk through our facility and how it differs from others, how we control uh, odor, how we control scents and uh, manage for safety. We do have overnight uh, stays for dogs that are part of our daycare family. We have the same dogs coming back every week. We have an enrollment plan policy, so our dogs come back every week. I mean, they can pause, go on vacation and those things. So we've got a group of dogs, we've got a group of uh, employees, and we all know each other. And so when a dog, when a, these dogs stay with, with us for boarding, overnight stays, which is less than 20% of our business. They know us, they're not uh, terrified of staying in a brand new kennel while the parents are on vacation. So that's kind of the philosophy that we have. You can, the other thing I wanted to mention, we are a franchise business, but we are a family owned business. So my son, Brandon is here. He lives in Parker with his fiance. They're getting married in a couple of months actually, in July. Um, he is the full-time operator of our businesses. I spend half my, my time on this. We also have, by the way, the building owner and our landlord here, if there are tenants related to that tonight, or questions related to that tonight. But we are part of a franchise, which we decided when we got into this to be the best we needed that kind of expertise supporting us and backing us up. And I, I work in private equity. I'm used to doing a lot of due diligence work. And did a lot and determined this was the very best franchise available to serve that purpose. So you can go ahead. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is we know what we're doing. Uh, we've taken this to heart. Brandon is a uh, animal science graduate from Michigan State University, um, worked in vet offices, interned at the MSU clinic, emergency clinic, 
um, did internships at daycares in Michigan. Um, so he's been around dogs for really the last seven years in a, in a big way. Um, and so when we opened our first store, which was in the Denver Tech Center a year and a half ago, um, we, we took off. And Brandon has done a great job doing it. We have won the award for the franchise. We had our franchisee meeting a couple of months ago. So based on cleanliness, safety, customer satisfaction, NPS scores, growth, we were the number one new store in the country. And Brandon won for the number one operational general manager in the country for all stores. So we've really taken it to heart. We've taken the recommendations from the franchise or seriously we call in their expertise and we implement it. You can go ahead. Another thing I should have mentioned there, our, the very first hire that we made was a marketing um, person named Nicole. She lives here in Parker as well. So she's an LSU graduate and is so excited about opening a Parker store. The other piece of our culture is foundation. We give back. Um, you know, I heard this from all of the pitches that I heard when I was doing my diligence from franchisors, and I can tell you in this case, this is a really important part of our culture and of the franchise's culture. We just were at the franchisee meeting. We spent hours with vets who had service dogs, and that's what we support. Um, it is so inspiring to hear their stories of how these dogs have changed our lives. So part of what we do every week is raise money. We do special events. We do toenail clip Tuesdays and raise money through our pet parents and we contribute as well. So we've now sponsored two dogs um, and the first one is in training. So you can go to the next one. And by the way, here he is, is the next slide. And we also partnered with a training company that, that trains these dogs, that takes dogs from kill shelters, so it provides them another life as well. That's a very difficult thing to do. Not a lot of um, agencies can, will even try that because this is a lot of work and takes special dogs, but they've been successful at it. So he's in training right now. We get reports on his progress periodically, and we're so excited, and our pet parents love it. It's such a great feeling for the community, and we will do the same thing with our store here in Parker. You can go ahead and go to the next one. So I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I do wanna to touch on some of the things that we do that we believe are very differentiated. Um, it starts with the coaching and training of our employees. When Brandon was an intern at an independent daycare in Michigan or boarding facility, no experience, they just hired him, threw him out there and said, go watch these dogs. They're running in five different directions and you can't even see them all. Cleaning their facility with bleach, all the things you shouldn't do and they were the best in town. So this training approach is all about science, all about safety, both in the playrooms and in cleaning. Um, the, the second thing I would mention is the cleaning partnership we have, and that's very important in this business, is through a company called Healthy Technologies that we've partnered with, the franchise or has partnered with, all very safe cleaning products, all environmentally safe cleaning products, and very regimented cleaning uh, procedures that we follow every single day. And then from a, what will be important to this, for this discussion tonight, noise, noise and order, order control, which I'll talk about in a minute. There's, over, there's about 200 stores open now, so they have learned the right way to do this, both to control noise and, and odor. And these stores are typically in retail centers. These are not like dog kennels. These are, and I'll show you some photos in a minute. Uh, they coexist in high upscale retail centers next to restaurants. Um, as well as in urban facilities. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. Safety is the number one priority every day. We talk three things in our store, safety, cleanliness, and fun. Safety is always number one, and we spend a tremendous amount of time on that. And that means safety with the dogs um, and, and for our uh, employees to know how to identify issues before they arise and to take every safety protocol very seriously. You can, you can go ahead. I won't go through all 10 of these. These are really 10 examples, and I've already mentioned a couple of them, the cleaning products. Um, when you bring a dog into our facility, we have four playrooms. They will be evaluated for a half an hour by one of our trained employees that does dog evaluations. The pet parent is interviewed separately for a half an hour. We introduce them in a way to see if they can work um, safely with our canine coaches, and then we introduce them to other dogs. If they pass that, we do a three-day evaluation. So we do a very disciplined and regimented 
safety uh, um, check when they first come in, and then we assign them to rooms by their size and temperament, which is usually related to age and breed as well. So we try to get the right mix of dogs in each room. Some of the younger ones that play hard and tumble and nip at each other, and that's their play style, versus we have one room called the lounge for the old guys who just want to hang around and play for 30 minutes and then, and then lay on each other. So we have a little bit of everything in there. Um, every room has rubberized flooring. You, you, can, you can keep going to prevent, to help the joints of the dog. You know, one of the things that I figured out in this quickly is, is how important safety is. And if you walk in, and this is what I would tell somebody to do if they're looking for a place to take their dog, and walk up to an employee and say, what do you do if you have a gas leak in your building and you've got 75 dogs in there and you've got five employees, what do you do? So those are the kind of things that we train on. We have a procedure for that. We, once a quarter, train our employees on it. We have our franchisor come in and test us on it. They'll walk into a playing room and ask an employee, what do you do? And there is a procedure, there is a kit, there are places outside where we can tether dogs. We've got ways to remove them from the building quickly. So those are the kind of things that we have picked up and learned from our franchisor, which are really important. Escape prevention has to do with the design of the facility as well as training of our employees. You can go ahead. So design of the facilities, um, they don't look like a dog kennel. This is, I don't know where this one is, but this is a storefront of one of them. We'll just flip through some photos. You can go ahead. I put this one in, this is in Omaha. This is most similar to the ones I looked at in terms of the existing building that we're going into. And Parker, I think our building's actually a little more attractive than this, but it'll have a similar look to that facility uh, right there. This is a facility in Portland. And the reason I put this one in there is this is coexisting in that urban area without noise issues, without odor issues, and, and serving a, a service to the community. This is an overview of a uh, kind of the standard cookie cutter Dogtopia design. Those big rooms are playrooms. Um, they have rubber floors on them, as I mentioned before. That's to protect the dog's joints. Those walls that you see in those playrooms actually extend all the way to the roof deck, and they are completely insulated. So we, when you walk into many, every dog facility I've been in that have separate playrooms, it is noisy, it is loud, they're on concrete. Here we have drop ceilings separated all the way to the roof and insulated um, walls. So it's expensive, but it's the upscale kind of daycare that we want to provide to our, to our pet parents. And it's been successful. I will tell you the demand for this has been overwhelming in the tech center, and we are now reaching capacity. This is a picture of our, one of our playrooms. This, I wanted to put in a couple of our store. This is our store in the tech center. That's an example of a playroom. Um, and that's an example, that is our spa at the tech center. We do spa services. We really just do baths, you know, nail clipping, cleaning of ears, those kind of things. We use this a lot for foundation fundraising where we will say, come in, we'll give your dog a bath, all the money's gonna to go to the foundation. So that's one of the techniques we use to raise money for service dogs. But pet parents love that. That's our front desk, and the reason I wanna put that up there is we push a lot of dogs through here quickly. As I mentioned before, the dogs that are in our facility have all been tested, they're all enrollees. When they are walking into the parking lot, the person at the front desk nine out of 10 times knows the dogs, radios back, Scruffy's coming in for daycare. By the time they get in, they grab the dog and they take them right back. They have one click and they're out the door. The pet parents are typically there for 30 seconds uh, in the morning. In the evening, they like to come and chat, but in the morning, they're in and out. So the reason I mention that is you know, some of the things we talk about is our congestion. You know, a lot of people coming at once, there's not. Our parking demands are minimal because pet parents come and go so quickly. That is a, an outdoor area that I'm not even sure where it is, but it is a Dogtopia outdoor area. And the reason I put it in is when you look at our site plan, this is really the shape of the outdoor area. It's kind of a long and narrow. I, it's difficult for me to tell from that photo, but ours is about 14 feet wide on this site plan and long. And we will have a divider uh, in there as well for small dogs and large dogs so they can never intermix. Okay. Noise and odor management, you can go ahead. I'm not gonna go through all of this, but one of the things I didn't mention yet is our HVAC systems. We 
invested over $100,000 for HVAC systems at our Dogtopia facility at the DTC, and we will here as well. It has 100% fresh air intake. Um, it completely exchanges the air in these playrooms three or four times an hour. When you walk into these playrooms, you will not believe the quality of the air that is in there. Between that and the rigorous cleaning that we doing that we do, and the temperature control is that's kind of an old slide there from Dogtopia, but we have ours between 68 and 72. If we get below 65 or above 75, Brandon and I get a call from ADT. It hasn't happened. Actually, it did happen once when we first opened when before we had the, anything in the room, but. We have uh, temperature sensors in there to make sure dogs are safe. This is sound reduction uh, in the building. We're not gonna go through all this detail, but Dogtopia has designs for sound reduction. I mentioned insulated walls all the way internally, but depending on whether you're on, on an exterior wall, whether you're on an interior wall that houses dogs, or whether it's a wall that is an adjoining tenant, we have different designs and that's what those are. And, and the most robust is if there is a tenant uh, that's in a demising wall in between, there's actually three layers of insulation uh, that, that is put in, in there. And it, again, it goes all the roof deck and everything is sealed. I was there when they did that at Denver Tech Center during construction and they took a power saw on the other side of the wall and just found the most noisy material that they could cut and, we, and they couldn't hear it. So it works very well. The outdoor space, um, we don't throw AstroTurf over concrete. That is not a good thing to do. I've seen that. I've seen that in facilities here in Parker. We have a compacted aggregate that's permeable. We put turf on it that's permeable. We clean any, any waste matter immediately when it's done. We also have a turf cleaner, and we use a bioenzymatic cleaner to remove any odors in there as well. So this, when you walk out there, it's gonna look and feel and smell much better than if you just walked into a dog park, for example. Go ahead. So cleaning, this, you know, the hardest thing about working in the store is cleaning. We do it constantly. We have training to do it, and we have technical resources to do it. But the way that we do this is our employees that we hire love dogs, and this is all about, this is for the dog. We keep this place spotless and clean and fresh air for the dogs, and then the light turns on and we get a lot of support. So when you walk in, and that's why we won an award. When they, when they gave it to us, the, the person from the corporate group said, it doesn't matter when I walk in there, I can bring anybody in there at any shift, and it smells and looks clean. So that was our ultimate compliment. I think we can just go ahead and skip that. So with that, I'll just conclude and, and ask if there are any questions. All right, questions for the applicant? I have a couple. Uh, what's the total capacity for dogs in your facility? The rated capacity, we don't have it calculated yet, but I can tell you it's gonna be about 150. 150? Yes. So you have 150 people coming in and out to in a morning to drop off everybody. Well, they don't, yeah, when there's 100, no, they don't. They don't all come at the same time. The peak hour today, we usually have around 40 in an hour. 40 to 50 mm -hmm. is the peak. And and our facility now is a bigger capacity. It has 175 capacity, and we're now hitting 150 dogs. Well, I, I, I doubt we'll ever allow it to go to 170, but that's the rated capacity. I just like the way it fills at 150 in terms of the space for the, for the dogs. Mm -hmm. But we do not have a congestion problem. We get 40 to 50 dogs in there, and Brandon is running up and down um, like mad with, we, and we staff it. We staff it with four people up front during those periods to just run dogs, and that's why they're in and out of there so quickly. Okay. I have images of, like, at the schools when they're dropping off the children. I went through that, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it is completely on. In our facility at the tech center, we have a, um, a gym. We have another business next to it, but we have a gym, and that gym just completely dominates. They have less space than us, dominates the parking because they got... 30 people coming in for a class and another 30 overlapping and our people are out of there, I, you know, I, four, four or five spots max at any one time. Um, the other question I had is, um, I know that artificial turf gets super hot in the summer, and especially when it's in direct sun. How do you control the temperature of the turf? 
this and this turf is specially designed doesn't do that but do you want to comment on whether we have any issues with yeah. come on up with turf temperature brandon is there every day i was going to say 100 percent of his time it's probably really 150 percent <laughs> Sorry guys, so uh, in the summertime we like to give it a good spray down before we head outside. There is a um, chart on Google that anybody can reference. It's a heat safety chart. It goes uh, in reverse as well for cold temperatures. Um, basically on that chart it'll rank one to five what temperature is safe uh, to not provide heat stroke to a dog. Um, things that can lower points are shade structures, access to water, um, things like that. But we monitor that very closely. If I see the temperature, for instance, is 75, I have a short faced dog like a boxer, I'm going to make sure that yard is out for no more than 15 minutes just so nobody overheats, things like that. So I actually reference the VCA chart for that. But the, the temperature of the turf itself, is that, is that an issue? It's not, so we do give it a good spray. Um, it does get a little hot in the summer, like in July, towards the end of July. But with the good spray, we do have splash pads going all day, and we do have pools in the yard as well. Any other questions, Rich? Yeah, a couple. So that open area for the dogs where the turf is, that's on the east side of the building, right? So probably in the... A hotter part of the day, that'll be kind of more, more shade in that area, I suspect. Yes, and the, color, the Colorado Department of Agriculture, a few couple of comments to make just from a practical standpoint. We don't put dogs outside when it's too hot or too cold, just from our common sense. But, um, and there's also a, a shade requirement. Um, so if there is open sun, we will put a, a tarp out there. But if, it, if we're standing out there and it feels hot, we, we just don't bring them out if it's too hot. Okay. The other question is, uh, you have overnight stay for, for dogs. How, how many do you anticipate caring for overnight? So if our business now, I'll give it to you from a revenue standpoint, 80% of our business are daycare dogs and 20% of our revenue is either spa, but I'll break it up. I mean, 15% is for overnight stay and 5%. So typically if we had a hundred dogs there being there during the day, there would be 10 at night. So is there a now, not, now at a holiday, a lot of people go out of town, you know, for, a, you know, the Christmas break, right. the winter break, it'll go up. We, we kind of limit it because we don't want to be a really a boarding facility. So there may be a holiday week where we could have up to 50. I think at most we've ever had for a boarding at the tech center was 60. We capped it at 60 because we are a, a daycare facility and we are in the enrollment model. We're promising these people they can come to our facility two, three times a week without making reservations like that. Um, so we did cap our 175 facility at 60 just to make sure we had 60 enough for 60 for boarding just to make sure we had the daycare space. Um, my staff much prefers daycare. And as far as the pet parent relationship goes, we prefer it as well because it educates the dogs, it helps the dogs. We're seeing oftentimes families are just taking dogs on vacation now as well okay but I want to make sure I answer your question is I mean the that that's what we've done and that's what we plan to do here as well I mean but the rated capacity of I mean every single dog that's in there could spend the night it just never happens and we wouldn't do that because we just don't want that much boarding business okay. and they, there's not a demand for it quite honestly yeah. with our customers are they kept in their own individual crates or yes or area can, can, or is that presentation still available or not yeah they use the same kind of home style crates you would use at home oh, okay now there's some dogs who don't like that and we have what we call suites so we have um, a, a, a number of suites for dogs that that don't like crates the reality is if you go back to that picture of the playroom uh, which is actually our facility number 15 thank you yeah see those crates along the side Dogs play in there all day. Those doors go to our outdoor space. They come in. They have their best friends. They literally do have their best friends. And, and we give pet parents the option if they, if they think their dogs don't want to be in a crate to, to sleep, to put them in a suite. But 90% of the dogs prefer to be in those crates because that's what okay. they're used to being and they want to be with their buddies. So is there a, an attendant there at night? No. No? Okay. No. In fact, very few of these overnight kennels in, in the area of have overnight people. Okay. It's all yeah. done by temperature, heat, fire, smoke, uh, sensors to make sure that we have very early detection if there's any issue in the, in the facility. Okay, that's all I had. Okay. Uh, my main question was the capacity, which I think you guys did a 
detailed job answering. Um, yeah, so other okay. than that, I'm good. All right. Well, thank you, okay. Mr. Green. Thank you. Um, any additional questions for uh, Cameron? No. No. All right, then, uh, since this is a public hearing, we'll open it up to public comment. If uh, you wish to make a comment on this item before us, please use the raise your hand feature on the Zoom application. Do we have anyone, Stacy? If you're on Zoom and you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand. We have no one. Okay. And then we will close the public comment. Any further questions? Um, no. Nope. And then we will close the public hearing at 755. Uh, Commissioner Discussion. Well, I, I, I had a question for Carson. I oh, didn't talk so, fast enough. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm well, sorry. Now we have to reopen the public hearing. <laughs> we will reopen the public hearing at 755. Yeah, my, my question for Carson is how will the uh, requirements regarding cleaning the outdoor relief station and maintaining the artificial turf, how will that be enforced? So, Those ongoing requirements that you have. Can, can, can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. So that would be something that could be handled through code enforcement if there were to be ever be a problem from a neighboring business or a resident that said like, hey, this is getting too loud or I'm smelling things. Mm -hmm. Code enforcement will be able to go out there and, and look at this and say, all right, these are the conditions and cite a violation if there, if there happened to be one. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. All right, any, now. We will close the public hearing at 7.56. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carson. <laughs> Good question, though. Um, the commissioner discussion. I was completely unfamiliar with Dogtopia before this application came before us. And uh, uh, I also checked their national website and read through a lot of their material. And I'm quite impressed with the, uh, the franchise that you, you know, have had such success with in Centennial, and I agree, uh, having uh, had tried to find times when I can get my dog in for some things, that we do have a, a need in Parker, and so I welcome this business. I think it's being located in a place that's uh, very appropriate, um, and uh, I wish you great success with it, and I will be supporting this uh, application. It sounds like a great facility for do dog daycare. And uh, glad to see it come to Parker. I think there's a need for it. And I think if dogs could talk, they probably would want to go back every single day. <laughs> so I'll be supporting it. I agree. Definitely support it. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. And uh, look forward to checking it out myself. Uh, I, 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 I could agree totally. As, a, as the father of a, a shelter veterinarian, I uh, can identify with a lot of the things you were talking about and uh, the standards that you hold your facility to, and she would appreciate that. Uh, anyway, any uh, rate, do we have a motion? Uh, yeah, I move the Planning Commission recommend Town Council approve the Lot 1 Block 1 Park Glen West use by special review request to allow for the pet daycare facility subject to the conditions that they listed. I'll second. second. It's been moved by Ruth Ann, seconded by Nick, that Planning Commission recommend Town Council approve the Lot 1, Block 1, Park Glen West use by special review uh, request to allow for the pet daycare facility subject to the conditions outlined in the staff's report. Uh, and I'll call the question. Nick? Aye. Ruth Ann? Aye. Rich? Aye. Chair is aye. Passes unanimously. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. All right. Bryce, any staff items? Yeah, a couple quick items. Um, I'd just like to recognize Carson's first presentation before the Planning Commission. I think he did an excellent job. Well done, Carson. He's been very helpful. Good. Good. And then a second item. Um, we have completed interviews, the interview team for Open Planning Commission positions. Um, there will be a study session on May 23rd with Town Council to discuss um, candidates and recommendations. On June 6th, uh, Town Council will consider a resolution, and then uh, those folks will be seated starting beginning of July. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Bryce. Thank you. 
All right. Do we have a move to adjourn? I move we adjourn. Second. Been moved by Ruth Ann, seconded by Rich, that we adjourn the meeting. And we'll call the question. Nick? Aye. Ruth Ann? Aye. Rich? Aye. Chair is aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>